We're talking about robbing us of hope, things that rob us of hope. That's the, that's the point of today's lesson. And always remember, it's not God that is removing or robbing us of hope. It's not God that's putting barriers to hope. It's easy when we're hit, especially blindsided with something, to, to people just seem to, why is God doing this to me? Or why is God letting this happen to me? And, and we, we got to remember, it's not God that's doing that. And, and just so often people have a tendency to get angry at God about that. And please don't. Please don't. Now, there may be consequences for bad choices, but it's not God that uh, is, is uh, st- the foundation of that evil or whatever. First uh, Corinthians fourteen thirty three. for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. And so God offers us peace. God offers us hope. I wanted to get at the, get that out there before we go any further. We know what a robber is or a thief the robber is someone who takes something from another person unlawfully or unfairly. Somebody that steals from us, takes something that belongs to us or we're responsible for, or have ownership of, whatever expression you want to use there, and they take that away from us. Uh, it can be by force or threats or trickery. Doesn't it make you angry when you read or hear about somebody who has taken advantage of a senior citizen, for example, and robbed them of their life savings. And and even though it was poor choices, perhaps on the part of the senior citizen, somebody facilitated that process. And it just, it makes you angry. And and where's the justice in that? And you just, you just really want to uh, see the person punished that did that. And that's kind of the idea there. It's, It's a terrible thing. Well, certainly Satan is our worst enemy, and he is only wanting to steal, to kill, to destroy. We're going to look at John Uh, 10.10. That's the idea of it. Um, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's bad enough. But then our Lord said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Not just life, not just existing, but to have a full and rich life. And somebody would say, well, I'm living and I don't have a full and rich life and I'm trying to be faithful. Again, maybe, maybe your focus needs to shift a little bit. Try to look for the things that are blessings in your life. I love the song, Count Your Many Blessings. And so Satan understands, and, and again, in... In the book that I had published several years ago on Satan's tactics, and I'm going to touch on a little bit of that here in a minute, um, it, the, the idea there of Satan attacking us, Satan cannot directly attack God. He knows that. It's a futile effort for him to directly attack God. So he attacks us. And when he draws us away from our Lord or interferes with us, with our Lord, hurts us in some way, then he's able to transfer that on to hurting God because we are God's greatest creation and God loves us beyond our understanding. And so Satan uses our weaknesses, our strengths, whatever he can to pull us away from the Lord. And and that's what we need to resist and fight against. Uh, There are all kinds of different strategies that Satan uses. Uh, Let me move over. Satan, uh, the idea of a strategy is there's a process I'm going to use. There's an outcome I'm looking for. And how am I going to achieve that outcome? And so Satan uses or has three desired outcomes. Uh, He wants to keep us from becoming a child of God. That, that's his primary intention. And oh, he is so successful at that. He virtually has to do very little to be successful at that. I, I think I read something, a quote yesterday, uh, teach 
your children about the Lord because the world will not or the world will teach uh, against the Lord, something like that. So Satan wants to keep us from becoming a child of God. That's his primary focus or activity. And he does that in so many ways, distractions and all kinds of different things. Another one then, of course, is he wants to influence. If, if we have sought our Lord, we have obeyed our Lord, he wants to weaken our faith. Uh, again, he knows that as our faith grows, so too does our ability to resist Satan. And so he wants to weaken that faith. And tied to it is the next point, Satan wants to weaken or destroy our influence. Those two are very closely related because if we have a weak faith, then we're going to um, likely become more involved in those things that are not a good influence, a positive influence, uh, or influencing others to follow the Lord. If our faith is weak, and this is a key point about hope, remember, that the closer we draw to our Lord, the more our hope is real. We go from, I'm, I may be saved, or I think I'm saved, to I am saved. See, that's a stronger faith. So if Satan can keep us from having that strong faith, then he also weakens our hope. And we give in to desperation. We give in to bad choices or we just give in. And, and so again, he, he uses these three in some combination. Ideally, someone never becomes a child of God. And so we can break that chain within ourselves and we can help others break that chain. We cannot break it for them, but we can help them. We can encourage them and teach them about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He provides the hope. We're the facilitators. I've, I've said it several times. Our, our, we are in the hope business because that's what we do. We, we bring people to our Lord. We teach them. We offer them a pathway to hope. And so we can break this cycle of what Satan tries to do. But always remember this. And, just don't, don't ever, Satan is powerful, uh, incredibly powerful, way beyond us, our ability to, to withstand him by ourselves. I'm going to touch on that here in a little bit. But Satan is a created being. He is not all powerful. He is not more powerful than the creator. You, you, the created cannot be more powerful than the creator. It just can't be. And, and so Satan cannot win unless we give in. That is such an incredibly important point to think about. Satan cannot be successful with these three unless we give in. Now, there should be a Bible verse coming to mind already about that. And as I was looking at this verse, I, I'm a process guy. I look at things in a pattern. I look at things as a one, two, three, that just helps me stay organized. And when I saw this verse, and I've seen this verse so many times, and we know it, we can quote it, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And we walk away from that first part of that statement. And so this is actually a three-part statement that is made here in James 4, 7. The first part is submit yourself to God. And this is from the English Standard Version. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I think it says submit yourselves, therefore, therefore submit yourselves to God is what it actually says. So res submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You see the three parts there? A lot of times we'll jump in there and say resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's a recipe for failure if you haven't done the first part. If you haven't done the first part, submit yourself to God. Satan is a whole lot more powerful than you are. I'm sorry, I don't care how long you've sat in a pew and attended church how many times or whatever. If you have not submitted yourself to God, it's just not going to work. So you have to have that first part. 
And then the second and third part, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So it's a three-part process. Don't forget the first part. And, and again, I'm looking at you guys because I can't see out there on the internet. And, and I know you know these things. But it ain't great to be reminded of them. I love what Peter said in Second Peter 1. I will not stop reminding you of these things, he says, as long as I'm alive. And so it's good to go back over these things and look at it. So anyway, the, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. One of the other things Lynn helped me with was selecting a graphic on this. I, 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 we, we looked at a couple of different ones. We liked this particular graphic because the person has the cross behind them. The subtle image there is that that shadow of the cross is there. Beneath the cross of Jesus... Remember that song? It's a great song. And the other thing I like about it is, remember I talked about hope sparked, hope sensed, and hope seen? That hope sparked was that little glimmer of hope that we see out there when we're struggling with hope. And I love the imagery of the sun rising after a long, dark night. And, and that's what I saw in this picture, the cross behind the person backing that person up and then seeing that glimmer out there. So, so you want hope? Turn to the Lord. Submit yourself to the Lord. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I love the imagery of flee from you. He doesn't just step away. He, he, he gets away. He can't stand it. But we have to submit ourselves to the Lord. Okay. I think, I think you got that point. All right, I want to talk a little bit about Satan's methods. Since Satan's going to use these three strategies, I'm not going to cover all the different ones that I, I, I covered in the book on Satan's tactics, but Satan, he, he keeps us focused on other things, especially he keeps us focused on our sin, and, and not just sins that we have done. Yes, I Actually, it's not necessarily a bad thing. We don't want to dwell there, but it is good to bring up to remembrance. Lord, thank you for showing me out of that or teaching me out of that or helping me grow beyond that. Thank you for rescuing me from that, whatever that sin in the past was. We don't dwell there, but it's not a bad thing to remember it on occasion. Sometimes we can't help but... But sometimes, too, the idea of focusing on our sin is, is focusing on the things that are in our life that we know are sin. And, and we focus on that element of our life rather than the spiritual element of our life. So Satan helps us focus on our sin and not on our Savior. Focusing on our past sin, focusing on ourself, not turning our focus to the Lord is what I mean by that. Matthew 14, 22 through 33, uh, we read where Peter walked on the water. I love that imagery, and we know that sermon well. Take your eyes off of Jesus, and you, down you go. And that's what Peter found out. Uh, it teaches us the object lesson of keep our eyes on the Lord, and uh, otherwise we're in danger of being lost. If we don't turn to our Lord, we are lost. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Satan is very skillful in reminding us of how unworthy we are of God's grace and how easy that way is instead of the way to our Lord. So we remove our wrong focus. We move beyond our past. We move beyond the sin that, as the Hebrew writer says, so entangles us. Uh, we turn toward the forgiveness, the salvation that is offered through our Lord. So again, Satan seeks to keep focus on sin, not on the Savior. The second one is uh, Satan seeks to have us misunderstand or discount the love and grace of God. And, and this is one, uh, some, some express that the greatest, um, and, and I think rightfully so, the, the, the greatest and, and uh, to me most difficult to fully understand concept is the grace and love of our Lord. Um, and, and so our, our, our Father's love is a giving love. He gives it to us. 
he demonstrates it. He puts our needs ahead uh, of, uh, I'm, I'm saying that wrong. <laughs> our Lord understands our needs and provides for our needs. And that agape love is, is putting others' needs before ourselves. That, that's the idea of it, of a giving love. Uh, we know that, John three sixteen for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And so God gives us grace when we least deserve it, Romans 5, 8. And, and so Satan wants us to misunderstand it or discount it. And when I say discount it, the thing that comes to mind in that regard is somebody who says, well, you can live any way you want to because God's grace is going to be there. That's, that's not a true understanding of grace. Uh, grace is when our Lord, our Father said, I, I, you know, you don't deserve this. What you do deserve, I'm not going to give you. I'm going to offer you reconciliation. <coughs> and yes, we, we, we go into great detail talking about how grace is there, but there's a price for it. And we have to understand that. And, and again, I'm, I'm talking to an audience that I know understands that. But be on the lookout for people who say, for example, well, there's no way God could love me. I am such a sinner. Well, you're focusing too much on self. You know, you're, you're greater than God? I don't think so. Yes, it's subject to consequences, but God's grace and love is there. And, and we, don't, we must not discount that. And so Satan would love us to discount it. Well, it doesn't matter. It's not that important. Or it can be there at no cost on my part, no giving away. What was it I read this morning? I was doing some studying and reading this morning. I mentioned it to Lynn. I'm sorry. I caught her blindsided there. <clears throat> Sometimes when we ask for forgiveness, we're really being, we're, let me see. Sometimes we ask for forgiveness, but we're actually asking to be excused. And I liked that. The, what the author was communicating in his article was that if we just say, uh, Lord, forgive me for that, but we have not repented, we have not made that commitment to turn to our Lord, we have not turned to our Lord, then we're saying, just, just excuse me, Lord. Satan seeks to have us give greater emphasis to evil and sadness in the world rather than the joy and peace offered for God. Now, remember, I'm talking about then the context of hope and the idea of focusing on sin and discounting God's grace and love. And then this idea of looking at things of the world rather than the joy and peace offered by God. People that don't know our Lord are going to try to seek solutions in the world. And the world focuses on self world doesn't focus on our Lord. And so people are driven in that direction. If they're not a part of our Lord, they're looking for solutions in the world. And the world is not going to turn us to the Lord. And, and so Satan blinds us in that. We're surrounded in life by so much misery. How sad it is. Even in last night, in periods of celebration of a new year and this sort of thing, there, were, there was evil going on in the world that unfortunately made the headlines. And and, and so um, we, we need to push those things away. We need to think on good things, wonderful things, the joys of life. And, and again, that's not walking around with blinders on. It's walking around keeping things in perspective. This, is, this, this, this world is not our home. We're just passing through. So Satan's very effective in using our life situations to influence us. Now, I want to shift gears here a little bit. I talked about how Satan is a created being. He's not greater than the creator. He attacks God through us. I, I doubt, I, okay, I don't know. I, I shouldn't say it that way. I suspect most of us have not had a one-on-one -on -one encounter with Satan. What we typically have is an encounter with someone or some situation or whatever that is serving Satan. You know, a a um, a minion of Satan, a representative of Satan, somebody who is a member of Satan's family rather than our Lord's family, somebody who is dealing with demons. 
and they're very alive and very much in this world. Maybe not in the view that we have, but there are demons out there. There are people that are evil to the core. Uh, It's a sad, sad situation, and we see them, and sometimes, unfortunately, they influence us. But there's other kinds of demons as well, and I want to talk just briefly about that, dealing with life's demons. Uh, The idea of, of something that is in our life, a situation in our life. And we hear the expression, oh man, I'm dealing with a demon, talking about something that's going on in their life. And this, this again is related to someone who is struggling with finding hope. And so I've given three different categories. There may be more, but I'm just talking about these. Physical demons such as addictions or health-related concerns. Again, it's natural if we're hurting and, and we're addicted to something that that grabs our attention. But again, we, we've got to keep that in perspective and we've got to learn how to turn that over to the Lord. And we have to help people find ways out of those things and treat them and teach them and guide them and most of all, love and accept them. Somebody who is struggling with uh, chemical dependence, I'm sorry, just coming forward and asking for prayers is not going to stop that situation. There are physical things, there are medical things, health things that a person continues to be addicted. It's not a light switch you turn off and on. There has to be, in in some cases, there could be, but in, in, in many cases, there has to be a a treatment they go through. And in some cases, they're never fully cured of those things. They have to learn to control those things. And so we have to understand that, and we have to love those people and care for those people and accept those folks. They may never be perfect like we are, right? You know better than that. And so we don't stand in judgment of them. We accept them. We understand And we help guide them out of that as best we can. So there's physical demons, addictions, health-related concerns. There's relational demons. These are times of loneliness and distrust and separation. People who are lonely and desperate for relationships, that's that's a core human element. They'll do desperate things at times. And again, we have to understand that and help people out of that. Relational demons. Emotional demons, anxiety, fear, depression, anger, quite often there's a combination of these things. Um, Addictions and health-related concerns can lead to relational things, can lead to emotional things. So see, they're they're interrelated, and and some may be stronger than others or whatever, but they, they blend together. And so it's, it's not a, okay, I'm done with this physical thing. I have no other issues going on. Sadly, that's not true. And again, I'm saying this because a person in these situations, especially these desperate situations, feel there is no hope. And there is hope. Absolutely there's hope. They may not see it, though. And so we have to help them and be there and sometimes be very proactive in things. So again, these are dealing with life's demons. So how do we do that? How do, how do, on, a, on a personal level, how, how, do we, how do we do that? And again, we're, we're trying to help people do this. They may not know how to do this. How do I focus on the Lord? I don't even know what the Lord is. Who is this Jesus guy you keep telling me about? Because see, I hear this and I hear that. And, and, and I, I'm confused. I don't know which one to believe. Okay. So although Satan is not, omnipresent his influence unfortunately is omnipresent because we are in the world and mark made a great point and i wrote it down (laughs) frequently sometimes almost always there's an innocent victim there is no such thing as a victimless crime is the idea that there's always a consequence that goes beyond us somebody involved in um driving under the influence has an accident and somebody else is killed and we know we know that situation from this congregation or or other things along that line so yes 
And because of that, it may lead to questioning about, it. does God really care? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it takes a lot to grow beyond that in somebody. And it's a natural reaction in many cases. And we like to think, oh, I, no, I'm going to be in that situation. I got this. Mm, be very careful. Very careful. And don't misjudge those who are struggling with that. Thank you, Mark. Okay. So we do try to stay focused on our Lord. Uh, it's God's will that we first become his children and, and we demonstrate that through our active and obedient faith in him. Uh, God protects us from Satan as we live faithful lives. Doesn't mean Satan's going to never have successes with us, but I, I, I try to read First John chapter 1 every day. Because even when we stumble and fall, our Lord is there when we repent to come back to him. He takes us back. So Satan does not win, does not even come close to winning unless we allow him to. Here's another one that we sometimes overlook. It's critical. Remain close to the family. 1 Peter 5, 8. We know that imagery of the roaring lion, and I love the imagery from a nature film, how the lion is waiting for uh, this, the one that wanders off by themselves or becomes ill. And you can look at a spiritual concept of that and, and stays away from our Lord. you got to stay connected to the family. I, I, uh, I used, and I, I, I kind of kid about this a little bit, I used to use the expression, there's no such thing as a solo Christian. Unfortunately, the Spanish word solo it means only. And yes, <laughs> we can, there's only Christian, but we're not Christians by ourselves. Our relationship with the Lord, Christianity itself is a relationship. Uh, and, and so if, if we try to do this on our own without the family, that's why we have the family, is to keep us from falling, to help keep us from falling. Our Lord is a family-oriented Lord. He seeks us to be a part of his family. He is addressed as the Father. He is, he is uh, not just our King, and, and so God is a very family-oriented God, and he put the family here on purpose to help us be a part of that and strengthen us and encourage us. What happens when a child hurts themselves? They run to mom, don't they? <laughs> Not dad. <laughs> dad will say, yeah, rub some dirt on it and get back out there to play and whatever. No, mom nurtures and cares for it. It's that kind of an imagery in the family. We have to stay connected to the family. Boy, COVID taught us that. How wonderful it was to come back together. All right, so when we become children of God, we're added to a wonderful family. And so let's stay a part of that. We remain close. We draw from. We're protected by each other in many cases. We hold each other accountable. We encourage one another. We forgive one another. We love one another. And so Peter teaches us that. Uh, Satan would have us isolate ourselves from the family. That way it's a lot easier to attack us, to pick us off. And, of course, we must remember to pray. And I want to make a key point. I've said it so many times. You've heard me say it. But I just I, I've got to say it. Always remember that God promises to answer prayers of his children. So it's beyond critical to first become a child of God. If God chooses to answer the prayer of somebody who's not his child, obedient child, praise God for his love and grace. But he promises to answer our prayers. What that prayer looks like, or answer looks like, that's on God. But God is going to answer our prayers. Not, not the way we might want it. It'll be better than. Not in our time frame. We work on God's time. Yes. 
No, we do. For, yeah, we forget it or we overlook it. But God promises to answer his children's prayer. Every promise of answering prayer that we find in Scripture is addressed to God's people. Always remember that. So don't hesitate to pray. If you're not in the Lord and you pray to the Lord, don't be surprised if the answer to that prayer is first, become my child. I appreciate Brent uh, over the last year or two has really tried to help people focus on that and address that it, through some videos he's got on YouTube and some other ways. And, and he, I think you even asked the question directly, uh, uh, perhaps this conversation is an answer to your prayer, or at least the initial stages of answering that prayer. So let's remind people of that. They come to us and say, well, I prayed about it. Maybe you're not praying the right way, which James talks about. You pray for self is the idea there. Or you're not seeing the answer. You're trying to you're trying to force God to answer it your way. And as Steve just pointed out, it doesn't work that way. It's God's answer. Yeah, sometimes the answer is no. God knows better. And we, we've heard great lessons on that. As a parent, sometimes we tell our child, no, <laughs> not even. <laughs> All right. So this is a key point. I always remember God promises to answer prayer. So let's get to praying. Uh, we either develop or enhance our prayer life. And we move in that direction. Okay. And then act with boldness. Seize the moment. We must not allow our doubts and fears to control our life. They're a part of life, but they don't control us. Don't let them control us. Um, God's given us a spirit of courage, 2 Timothy 1.7. And, and when we're talking about boldness here, uh, it's not from our own merit. It comes from allowing God's power to work through us. That's a couple of weeks ago, or was, it, or was it last week? Last week I talked about outrageous courageousness. That's what acting with boldness is about. It's doing things, the world expects us to do something else, but we don't do what the world says. Um, <clears throat> faithful follower of our Lord, we recognize our fears, we overcome them, we act boldly in the service. The battle belongs to the Lord. Uh, God says, trust me, I've got this. All right, let me wrap up. Satan cannot defeat God. Uh, so seek, uh, he, he seeks to hurt him through us, but Satan loses. Uh, he, he cannot hurt God. He'll use every means to attack us, our strengths and weaknesses. Sometimes we think he only uses our weaknesses, but he uses our strengths too. And typically the way that happens is through pride. So be, be very, very careful about that. Um, he, he, again, he seeks to prevent us from becoming a child of God or weaken our faith or weaken our influence, usually a combination. And so we serve a God who through his love and grace, he offers us hope in this life as well as hope eternal. Uh, God strengthens, he protects us. And when Satan attacks us, we've got our Lord with us. We do experience demons in our life, whatever form they take, but we don't give in to them. We combat against them, and the Lord works with us on that. Um, our Lord never stops loving us. He's always ready to welcome us home. He's always ready to welcome all of us home, regardless of how we might have submitted to demons. Satan cannot rob us of our hope if we maintain our relationship with the Lord because Satan is not more powerful than our Lord ever. All right, that concludes our lesson. Next week, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to focus on some specific ways in which we can um, regain hope. Thank you very much for your time.